Hello and welcome to this edition of News Today. Without delay, let's have a look at the headlines first. Aditya L1 successfully completed its first halo orbit. Niti Aayog launched Sampurnata Abhiyan. Demand of restoring education to the state list has been made. Center is developing national indicators to measure extreme poverty. Bretton Woods Conference celebrate its 80th anniversary. Sixth meeting of the GPAI Ministerial Council held in New Delhi. Let us begin with the very first news. In a significant achievement in India's space exploration endeavors, Aditya L1 has successfully completed its first halo orbit. Inserted into its halo orbit in early 2024, Aditya L1 takes 178 days to complete a revolution around the Lagrange L1 point. At the Lagrange point, the gravitation pull of the two large bodies equals the necessary centripetal force required for a small object to move with them. In a two-body gravitation system, there are a total of five Lagrange points denoted as L1, L2, L3, L4, and L5. Now, what exactly are halo orbits? These are periodic and three-dimensional orbits resulting from the interaction between the gravitation pull of the two planetary bodies and the centrifugal force on a spacecraft. Halo orbits exist in any three-body system, such as the Earth-Moon satellite system, and are mainly linked to L1, L2, or L3. There are significant benefits to placing Aditya L1 in a halo orbit. This ensures a mission lifetime of five years, reduces fuel consumption by minimizing station-keeping maneuvers, and provides an unobstructed view of the sun. Let's take a moment to discuss the Aditya L1 mission launched in the year 2023. This is India's first space mission dedicated to studying the sun. This mission aims to study the sun's corona, solar emissions, solar winds, and flares, and coronal mass ejections. It will carry out round-the-clock imaging of the sun and is equipped with seven payloads, including the visible emission line coronagraph and the solar ultraviolet imaging telescope. In conclusion, the successful completion of Aditya L1's first halo orbit marks a milestone in India's space exploration journey, offering invaluable insights into a closer star, the sun. Ahead in the news, Niti Aayog has launched the Sampurnata Abhiyan, a three-month campaign with an ambitious goal. This initiative aims to achieve saturation of six key indicators in aspiration districts and six key indicators in aspiration blocks. Transitioning to the details, these districts and blocks are part of the larger aspirational districts program and aspiration blocks program, respectively. Let's break down the key indicators for each. In the aspirational districts, the focus is on the number of soil health cards distributed the percentage of schools with functional electricity at the secondary level and the percentage of children fully immunized, among others. Meanwhile, in the aspiration blocks, key indicators include the percentage of persons screened for diabetes and hypertension and the percentage of self-help groups that have received a revolving fund. To understand this better, let's delve into the background of these programs. The Aspirational Districts program launched in 2018 by Niti Aayog aims to transform 112 districts across the country quickly and effectively. It focuses on five themes, health and nutrition, education, agriculture and water resources, financial inclusion and skill development and infrastructure. Progress in these districts is measured against 81 indicators of development. Building onto this, the Aspiration Blocks program was introduced in the year 2023. This program aims for the saturation of essential government services in 500 blocks across 329 districts. It also focuses on five themes, which include health and nutrition, education, agriculture and allied services, basic infrastructure and social development. However, here the progress is measured against 40 development indicators. As we look at the bigger picture, the Sampurnata Abhiyan is a strategic initiative to ensure significant milestones in these aspiration regions. By focusing on critical indicators, Niti Aayog aims to foster holistic development and uplift the standard of living in these areas. In conclusion, the Sambodita Abhiyan stands as a testament to the government's commitment to inclusive growth and equitable development. In our next news, let's talk about the growing demand to restore education to the state list in India. Currently, education falls under the concurrent list of Schedule 7 of the Constitution, allowing both the centre and the states to enact laws. However, there is a rising call to return education to the state list. To understand this demand, let's delve into the background of education's listing in India. Under the Government of India Act of 1935, education was placed under the provincial legislative list. After independence, it remained on the state list of the seventh schedule. 
However, the 42nd Constitutional Amendment in 1976, based on the Swarn Singh Committee's recommendation, moved education to the concurrent list. Notably, there was no explicit reason provided for this change. The move to include education in the concurrent list had its benefits. It enabled the evolution of all India policies on education, addressing issues of professionalism and corruption in state-run universities. Despite these advantages, there are compelling reasons to shift education back to the state list. Firstly, a one-size-fits-all approach is neither feasible nor desirable for a country as diverse as India. Secondly, a significant disparity exists in revenue expenditure on education. According to the analysis of budgeted expenditure on education in 2022, the center contributes only 24%, while states bear the burden of 76%. Additionally, returning education to the state list would allow for syllabuses to be tailored to meet the specific needs of each state. Looking at international practices provides further context. In the United States, state and local governments set overall educational standards and supervise colleges and universities, with the Federal Education Department focusing primarily on financial aid policies. In Canada, education is managed by the provinces. Germany assigns legislative powers for education to the states. Similarly, in South Africa, national departments handle school and higher education, while provinces implement national policies and address local educational needs. In conclusion, the demand to restore education to the state list is driven by the need for tailored educational policies that reflect the unique requirements of each state. Ahead in the news, the Indian government has announced plans to develop a national indicator to measure extreme poverty. This revelation came as part of the National Indicator Framework 2024, which tracks India's progress on sustainable development goals, including the aim to eradicate extreme poverty by 2030. The need for this new indicator stems from several factors. Firstly, India's current official poverty line is based on the Tendulkar Committee's report from 2009, which many consider outdated. Committees led by D.T. Lakhrawala 1993, and C. Rangarajan 2014 also suggested criteria for poverty lines. However, C. Rangarajan Committee's report was not adopted by the Centre. Secondly, there is a significant discrepancy in global poverty estimates for India. The International Monetary Fund claims less than 1% of Indians lived in extreme poverty in 2021, while the World Bank puts that figure at 12.92% for the same year. Experts stress that a reliable poverty estimate is crucial for effective policy making and monitoring anti poverty programs. Currently, India measures poverty based on consumption expenditure, with surveys conducted every five years by the National Sample Survey Office. The Niti Aayog's National Multidimensional Poverty Index shows some progress, with poverty rates dropping from 24.85% in 2015-16 to 14.96% in 2019 21. However, the government believes a more precise measure of extreme poverty is necessary. Wrapping up, take a quick look at the calculation of poverty by Suresh Tendulkar Committee. A person living on a monthly expenditure of rupees 1000 per month or rupees 33 or less per day in cities and rupees 816 per month or rupees 27 or less per day in villages is considered poor. Rangarajan Committee raised this limit and set an income of Rs 32 for rural India and Rs 47 for urban India as the poverty line limit. In conclusion, as India strives to meet its sustainable development goals, this new national indicator for extreme poverty could prove instrumental in shaping future policies and interventions. In our next news, Today marks the 80th anniversary of the Bretton Woods Conference, a pivotal event that shaped the post-World War II international monetary system. Officially known as the United Nations Monetary and Financial Conference, this gathering took place in 1944 in Bretton Woods, New Hampshire. Let's begin by learning more about Bretton Woods Conference. The conference's primary purpose was to establish new rules for the global financial order in the aftermath of World War II bringing together delegates from 44 nations. One of the most significant results was the creation of the Bretton Woods institutions, the International Monetary Fund and the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, now known as the World Bank. The conference also established a fixed exchange rate regime, 
where each member country set a fixed value for its currency in terms of gold or the US dollar. However, after the dollar exchange crisis of 1971, when USA suspended the dollar's convertibility into gold, and 1973, floating exchange rates was promoted. Another important outcome was the promotion of free trade, seen as essential for international prosperity and peace. Today, the IMF and World Bank continue to serve distinct but complementary roles. The IMF focuses on promoting global macroeconomic and financial stability, providing short- and medium-term loans to countries experiencing balance of payments problems. The World Bank, on the other hand, concentrates on long-term economic development and poverty reduction through technical and financial support for various projects and reforms. Both institutions now boast memberships of 190 and 189 countries respectively, including India, and are headquartered in Washington, D.C. However, India is not a member of WB's International Centre for Settlement of Investment Disputes. It's worth noting that countries must first join the IMF to be eligible for World Bank membership. In conclusion, as we reflect on 80 years since Bretton Woods, we are reminded of the enduring impact of international cooperation on global economic governance. Ahead in the news, the sixth meeting of the Global Partnership on Artificial Intelligence Ministerial Council concluded today in New Delhi, marking a significant step forward in international cooperation on AI development and governance. The meeting, led by India as the 2024 Chair of GPAI, brought together representatives from the partnership's 29 member countries. GPAI, an integrated partnership of OECD members and other nations, aims to bridge the gap between AI theory and practice by supporting cutting-edge research and applied activities. Key outcomes of the meeting included a consensus on the future vision of GPAI. Participants recognized AI's transformative potential in shaping our societies and economies, while acknowledging emerging risks such as disinformation and harmful biases that could lead to discrimination. The Council emphasized the importance of ensuring safe, secure, trustworthy and human-centric AI development through an inclusive, multi-stakeholder approach. It welcomed the election by GPAI members of Serbia as lead chair of GPAI for 2024-25. In a related development, the World Intellectual Property Organization recently released its Patent Landscape Report on Generative AI. The report highlights India's emerging prominence in the field, ranking it as the fifth largest location for Gen AI invention globally. India filed 1,350 Gen AI patents between 2014 and 23, boasting the highest growth rate at 56% per year. China leads the ranking followed by the US. In conclusion, the consensus reached in New Delhi not only highlights India's growing leadership in the global AI discourse, but also sets the stage for more coordinated efforts in harnessing AI's potential while mitigating its risks. As we conclude today's main news, let's have a look at some quick updates. The Supreme Court affirmed that the constitutional right of a speedy trial, as enshrined in Article 21, applies to all cases, regardless of the crime's gravity. Speedy trial as constitutional right emphasizes that defendants should be tried for their alleged crimes within a reasonable time period. The Union government constituted eight cabinet committees. These cabinet committees are constitutional under the Transaction of Business Rules 1961. New Zealand has denied India's request for a certification trademark equivalent to a geographical indication tag on basmati rice as it is grown outside of India also. Earlier, on the same ground, it was rejected by Australia. Recently, Kerala's Chief Minister asserted that the Pachaturutu initiative will play a key role in achieving ambitious net-zero carbon target of state. The Pacha Turutu project aims to create man-made mini-forests. A multi-city study examining the short-term health impacts of air pollution in India has been published in the Lancet Planetary Health. Talking about the key observation, approximately 33,000 annual deaths can be attributed to PM2.5 pollution in 10 cities of India. In response to Zika virus cases reported in Maharashtra, the Union Health Ministry has issued an advisory to state governments to stop its spread. Zika virus is primarily transmitted by the bite of an infected mosquito Aedes aegypti. 
Researchers have carried out an analysis of the mechanisms underlying the flexibility of crystals of metal organic frameworks. They attributed the flexibility to large structural rearrangements associated with soft and hard vibrations within a crystal. New chairperson of National Medical Commission has been appointed. National Medical Commission is a statutory body constituted by an act of parliament known as National Medical Commission Act 2019. The World Health Organization has released its first ever clinical treatment guideline for tobacco cessation in adults. It is expected to help more than 750 million tobacco users who want to quit all forms of tobacco but find it difficult to do so. Researchers from the Zoological Survey of India have recorded a new species of forest, dwelling horned frog from the Tale Wildlife Sanctuary, Arunachal Pradesh. The new species has been named after the dominant Apatani community in Arunachal Pradesh. Before we sign off, let's challenge your understanding in today's installment of Test Your Knowledge. Thank you for joining us. We hope you found this episode of News Today engaging. For the solution to today's quiz and to access the PDF version of News Today, remember to visit the provided links in the description below.